Hello. How are you? Good. I can sort of see you. Um, so my name is Bree Code, and I've been in the video game industry for about 15 years. I worked eight years at Ubisoft Montreal as a lead programmer on Child of Light and three Assassin's Creed games. Before that, I wrote AI code at Relic Entertainment for Company of Heroes. And that's my favorite picture of me that I just clicked past. I spoke at Nordic Game Conference two years ago, um, and I was still at Ubisoft. Around that time, something happened that radically changed the way that I thought about games and radically changed or radically deepened my own understanding of why I play games and what I look for in games. So this change in thinking changed me, and I couldn't bring myself to continue making the same old games anymore, and shortly afterward, I spectacularly quit my job with no plan. Um, shortly after that, I started my tiny game studio, True Love. We're making video games with people who don't like video games, and we're making games about care. The first game we'll release is made with Eve Thomas. She's a magazine editor and artist in Montreal. Her game is about self-care. And because I'm so rebellious, I can't follow my own rules. I'm also making a game with someone who loves video games, Alicia Lidecker, um, interaction director at the new Magic Leap studio in San Francisco and who gave an amazing talk on systemic game design yesterday that I hope you got to attend. Her game is about vulnerability and connection. Um, my studio's games follow directly from my shift in understanding about games and what I look for in games, and this talk will be about that shift. And I'm going to share some pretty ugly and uncomfortable truths in this talk, so let's just take a few deep breaths first. I love video games, but most of my friends find video games boring. Everywhere I go, I meet people who aren't interested in video games. Just yesterday evening, a man waiting in front of me at the restaurant where I ate dinner asked me if I was here for that video game conference, too, and then scoffed and made it clear he didn't like video games. My favorite thing at a dinner party on a Tinder date is to watch the other person squirm and struggle to relate when I mention I work in games. They'll bring up some old game they used to play, try to talk about it, and then confess that they don't care about video games. And in Tim Gunn's words, talking about the fashion industry, this is, a, this is a design failure and not a customer issue. We could do better. The multitudes of white masculine gamers who dominate the games industry have made experiences that are relevant to them, but not to most people. We're in a closed loop. People who like video games come to work in the video game industry, then they continue to make what they like, it makes sense, but it's boring, and it's a missed opportunity. When you work only with experts and with people similar to yourself, you tend to get stuck in what's called a local maximum. People who are similar to each other think similarly. You've drawn the same knowledge base and approach problems from the same angles. And it goes deeper than that. In groups of similar people, there's a further psychological pressure to conform to the stereotype of the group. This is unconscious, and you don't know you're doing it. But the result of this pressure is that you yourself will have fewer good ideas when you're in a group of people who are similar than you will have yourself in a group of people who are different to you. Study after study shows that diverse groups are better at innovation than expert groups. This holds from individual teams in psych labs to individual teams in corporations to overall corporate performance. When you don't have innovative ideas, you refine your own solution to a problem and make it better and better, but you don't discover radically different solutions that would be radically better. And so video games are boring to many people. People turn to entertainment to solve problems in their lives, and life is really difficult. Our world is shocking. The wealthy are ascending further and further. The weather is turning more and more unfamiliar. Our jobs are disappearing or weren't there in the first place. The internet is enabling the most vile swarms of voices to shout their racism and misogyny and other hatred at vulnerable individuals. Our national governments seem unwilling, or at best powerless, to address any of these global issues. We are checking our phones compulsively with horrified fascination. We are overwhelmed with shock from advertising, from entertainment, from social media, from the news media, from world events. 
And I think that what my friends are looking for in art and in entertainment is relief from this shock, from what the artist Harry Giles called a constant state of shock. My friends are not looking for shocking games. They are looking for care, to take care and be taken care of. At the very least, care means that they don't want to be insulted. They don't want to see damaging stereotypes of their identities, and they do want to see references to culture they understand and like, culture beyond geek culture. But they also want experiences in which they grow, experiences in which they learn and change as a person, in which they can explore who they are and how they want to relate to the world, in which they can understand the world. Video games that are more about care and characters would be more culturally relevant to more people, I think. But I think also that it's not only for cultural reasons that my friends prefer care to shock. I think there's also an underlying physiological reason, and I think it has something to do with stress reactions, and I think this holds the key to the future of a much more interesting, much more relevant games industry. A few more breaths. When you're playing a video game and there are a lot of things flashing on the screen and there's danger and it's shocking and it's fun, that's a fight or flight response to stress. With fight or flight, when you experience a threat, your sympathetic nervous system kicks in and releases adrenaline followed by dopamine. If you like games like this, it's probably because adrenaline and dopamine are very enjoyable. Your pupils dilate, your heart beats faster, your airways open up and you feel exhilarated. You feel alive and you feel powerful. But not everyone likes these kind of games. I don't. My friends don't. My Tinder dates don't. People I talk to at bus stops don't. The guy at the restaurant last night didn't. And I think my friends find video games like this boring not only because they aren't interested in more stories about callous white men, and not only because they don't know how the controls work or don't get the references to bro culture or geek culture, but also because they don't get an adrenaline high. They have a completely different response to stress. So this is my cousin, Christina. She's one of my friends who finds video games boring. What she loves instead are contemporary feminist art, vegan food, and longboarding with her friends. She has never understood why I work in games. In fact, she is perhaps, of all my friends who don't like video games, she's perhaps the most hostile of my affection for video games. She sees me as a designer, but definitely not a game designer. When I would message her stressed out about work when I used to work, she wouldn't offer her support. Instead, she would encourage me to quit and go back to school to study interior design or industrial design, something that was more relevant to her and that she thought would make me a lot happier. She thought I was wasting my life in the video game industry. A few years ago, Christina's husband's brother bought a PS4 and gave her his old PS3. At the same time, she got a tablet. For the first time, she asked me about video games. And this was very interesting to me. I thought maybe I would finally be able to share the thing I adore so much with this person whom I adore so much. Um, spoiler, I was wrong. She didn't get into the games that I recommended. She didn't get into games after she played the games I recommended. In fact, she's still so uninterested by games that when I showed her this slide, she said, Oh, I really like that the thing, the, the game thing is gold. She doesn't know the word controller. She's not interested. Anyway, a few years ago, though, when she started to play some games I recommended, something very interesting to me did happen. Of course, the first game I recommended to Christina back then was Journey. It seemed like the natural fit based on her interests, especially with her intense interest in contemporary art. To my surprise, she didn't finish it. She didn't like that there is a snake that can kill you. And it's not that it was too hard, it's that she's just deeply uninterested in being attacked in a game. But it did intrigue her enough that she asked for more recommendations. And I recommended a few more games, and she played a few more games, and she became slightly more intrigued with each one, although none of them were working for her. But after a while, I thought I had built enough trust with her to recommend my favorite game Skyrim. She googled it and texted me back something like, 
Yeah, I don't know why you think I would play this. I don't watch Game of Thrones. I don't like swords. I don't like fighting. I don't like dragons. I don't like things that look like that. I told her she would hate the first bit with the dragon, but just to get through it and then give it a chance and get back to me with her thoughts, and then I never heard back from her. Three weeks later, my phone rang, and no one ever calls me because they know I don't answer. I don't like the phone. But I glanced down and saw Christina's name on the screen, and my stomach sank as it occurred to me that there must be some kind of family emergency. I answered, and Christina was crying. And she said to me, Lydia died. We have no Lydia in our family. She was talking about Lydia in Skyrim, and for three weeks she had been playing Skyrim obsessively, and now she'd accidentally killed Lydia, and she didn't have a recent save game, and she didn't know what to do, and she was really upset. Christina said to me through her tears that she didn't realize that you could develop an emotional attachment to a character in a video game. She didn't realize that you could create your character and exist as a version of yourself in a world of characters whom you care about. I had never realized that she didn't know this because I know it so well. This is what I've been doing with my life all my life. She said to me that for all these years, it wasn't that she didn't like video games, it was that she didn't know what they were or she didn't know what they could be. Christina finds video games boring, but she loved Skyrim. She isn't interested in medieval warfare or swords or dragons, and she found the controls hard. She doesn't like anything to do with fighting. She doesn't like feeling frustrated, and she doesn't like feeling attacked. And that is why she eventually quit Skyrim. But she loved Skyrim because she loved the characters. She loved creating her character, doing quests for other characters, joining guilds, and bringing Lydia along on her adventures. She liked experimenting with who she is in a social context of characters whom she cares about and who care about her. After a long day of office politics and being catcalled in the street and seeing Trump's face all over TV and experiencing all the other daily hostility in the world, Christina doesn't feel like being shocked in a video game, but she loves taking care. Christina doesn't like adrenaline, and neither do I. But with Skyrim, there's something similar to fight or flight, but also very different from fight or flight, that is probably going on with us. It's called tend and befriend. Like fight or flight, tend and befriend is an automatic, physiological reaction to threat. It's not learned, it's instinctual and immediate. If you experience tend and befriend, it's because your body releases oxytocin or vasopressin when you're stressed, followed by opioids. This calms your sympathetic nervous system so you don't get the flood of adrenaline. Instead of wanting to fight or to flee, you stay relatively calm but aware. Your pupils dilate, you become fearless, and you are less sensitive to pain. You instinctively and immediately want to protect your loved ones, to seek out your allies, and to form new alliances. Oxytocin intensifies social feelings, and opioids feel extremely warm and lovely. I don't care for adrenaline, but I really, really like this. This feels delicious, luscious, powerful. I have a, after the last time I gave this talk, someone asked for an example, so I have one. One time I was with two friends halfway into a hike in the Queen Charlotte Islands in Canada when I heard a very loud roar. I looked up the hill and my friends didn't see it, but I saw a grizzly bear bigger than the SUV that we'd driven in on and left at the trailhead and I froze, and everything went into slow motion and I became aware of every detail in the forest around me. As I watched, the bear roared again. After it roared the second time, we turned and we walked out calmly but determinedly right out of the trail together. And I was in front and as I turned a corner right in my face on a branch, its eyes level with my eyes, was this little white owl, a kind that is only in the Queen Charlotte Islands. And everything was still happening in slow motion, and the owl and I looked at each other's eyes, and then it blinked, and then I blinked, and then it just spread its wings and flew away. And I felt this, like, really great 
deep spiritual connection to that owl. The moment felt very powerful and warm, like falling in love, and I'll never forget that moment. But I know now that connection was all in my head, and that was oxytocin, and that was opioids. Maybe the owl had the same stress reaction, though. Um, and a very interesting thing about tandem befriend is that this oxytocin opioid thing isn't only stimulated by threatening interactions. Unlike fight or flight, there are many other less stressful ways to experience this. It's there when you touch or even think about someone you love. It's very much there during sex. It's there when you play fetch with your dog or chill out with your cat. It's there when you look at a cute baby. It's there when you watch cute animal videos on the internet. And even more interestingly, it's even there when you exclude someone you don't like. When I first read about Tend and Befriend, I suddenly understood myself so much better. I thought, oh shit, this is how I usually react to stress. It's how I usually react to most things. And it's not just me and it's not just my friends. When people are stressed, we tend to affiliate more often than to brawl. It seems that most women and many men have the tend and befriend reaction. It's possible that this could be our dominant stress response in general, maybe not in the games industry. But have you heard of it before? Maybe not. It's barely been studied. It's barely been discussed. It's barely just been identified. In 1998, some researchers at the UCLA Social Neuroscience Lab were attending a talk by a prominent stress researcher in which he said, we shocked the animals and of course they all attacked each other, just kind of offhand as part of his presentation about human stress response. This statement struck those researchers from UCLA as obviously not descriptive of humans. That's not how we behave, at least not all of us. So they looked into it, and by 2000, Dr. Shelley E. Taylor and her colleagues had identified the tend and befriend response in this paper. But why so late? Why not until 2000? The answer is blinkered researchers and their bad samples. Like much other research in many other fields, most stress research had been done with men and male animals, primarily male rats. Prior to 1995, only 17% of stress research had been done with women or female animals. Throughout many fields, when female bodies don't fit the data, the researchers blame menstruation, throw the female data out of the sample, and keep going. And that's exactly what happened in stress research. I'm not kidding. Not at all. What's more, when it comes to studying humans rather than animals, many researchers only access what is known as the weird sample weird for white, educated, industrialized, rich, and democratic. This is also not a comprehensive sample. And most researchers also belong to this sample. When you work only with people similar to yourself, you tend to get stuck in local maxima in bad ideas. I grew up being taught that fight or flight was my stress response, and it's not. And it's not only stress research that skews male and skews weird. It's a lot of research, it's a lot of design, it's a lot of researchers, and it's a lot of designers. It's a lot of gamers. For those of us who aren't white, educated, industrialized, rich, democratic men, it's possible many things that we know about ourselves are just wrong. That many things we know about ourselves are just wrong. Eighty percent of drug studies that are done in mice are done with male mice only. In neuroscience, studies of male animals outnumber studies of female animals by 11 to 2. Seventy percent of pain patients are women, but 80 percent of pain studies use only male rodents. We also see these kind of oversights in the design of cities. We see it in the generally accepted room temperature for public spaces. Until 2011, we saw it in the design of airbags in cars. Until 2009, we saw it in the understanding of the shape of the clitoris. We see it in the diagnosis of ADHD and Asperger's. We see it in the typical symptoms for heart attacks, and that affected one of my friend's parents' lives recently. And this also leads to the fact that of young people who have heart attacks, young women are twice as likely to die as young men. 
We see oversights about skin color in the design of color film, and from there we see oversights about skin color in the design of face tracking and eye tracking. We see oversights in the design of VR hardware. We see all kinds of oversights all over the games industry. This is so fucking boring. It exposes a lack of imagination and a lack of care, and it harms people. Fuck this. I understand how it happens. A casual dismissal of other perspectives comes easily when someone has his own perspective validated throughout his life. When bodies like his have been studied by science, when bodies like his have been designed for, when characters like him are all over film and television and video games and the news and politics and corporate boards, when his confidence has been repeatedly interpreted as competence, and when his bosses and mentors see themselves in him and make space for him. But I think it must be more than cluelessness or we wouldn't be here still after so many years of fighting for change. I suspect some of it must also be based in fear. Fear of the unknown, fear of loss of status, fear of loss of power. But neither cluelessness nor fear leads to good ideas and neither cluelessness nor fear are good for the long-term health, status, or power of any industry. A prominent games researcher told me once that he too doesn't try to study women because you can't predict women. This statement strikes me as obviously not descriptive of women and I was horrified at the time. A technical director on a AAA screamed in my face once that he hates feminists and that I don't belong in the games industry. I was disgusted. I also wondered where his fear came from. Meanwhile, I've watched multiple teams search for new kinds of core gameplay loops that don't depend on guns without thinking outside of recreating the same natural and quite rightly beloved adrenaline high. They're missing some data. They're missing some perspectives. They could ask more people. At one point, a boss of mine declared in the face of focus groups and research proving otherwise that my target market craves only Vogue magazine and not also deep character systems. Maybe he was scared of what he doesn't understand, or maybe he was too lazy to try to understand it. I don't know. But finally, I laughed my way right out of that job and into my own studio. Hold on just a sec. I wrote too much text to fit on the display. Since then, I've heard many times that women only like match three. I've heard that there is no room for innovation in mobile games. I've heard that my insight about shock and care in video games was more about my own personal psychology than any generalized trend. I've heard that I shouldn't mention anything to do with gender bias in my talks because it turns people off from hearing the message. It's not rare that I have these reactions when I recount this research. A woman I very much respect told me that you can't change the world, but you can make your little corner of it better. I found my little corner. I'm bored of patriarchy and its lasting effects on my life, on all of our lives, but I'm very interested in looking at the gaps in game design and fixing them. Are you? Are we so fragile that we ignore the realities of entire groups of people when our own feelings are hurt? That we ignore science? Are we, just in, are we interested in building towards an inclusive, robust, relevant, and just future? So then, what is game design missing? I ask this question not just in terms of cultural elements, which are important, not just in terms of diverse protagonists, which are important, not just in terms of references beyond fantasy and science fiction and modern day warfare and nostalgic pixel art. I ask this question in terms of game mechanics and game systems. I ask in terms of adrenaline, dopamine, oxytocin, opioids, and other reward systems. And what about personality psychology and positive psychology and other reward frameworks? There's a lot of things we could be looking at. I ask in terms of gameplay that helps a wider range of people understand themselves and their response to stress and to each other and to the world. What do we take for granted about play styles and about player motivation and other frameworks that we use to think about games? 
What do we take for granted about fun? Could some of this be wrong or incomplete? Why are game genres defined the way they are and can we think outside of them? What does it take to induce a flow state in the player? Does it always require frustration? Who designed all these rules? What players are we studying? Who should we be talking with? I know who I'm talking with, and I know who I'm working with. I'm talking with and working with people who don't like video games or who have strong visions of radically different places where we can take video games in the future who've been ignored by an industry that seems either too lazy or too scared or at best, best too risk averse or too complex to be able to look outside itself. And I know that I've never been so satisfied with or felt so connected to my work. Learning about Tend and Befriend also helped me understand not just how I react to stress but to most things and why I can be overly compassionate and overly petty and other things both good and bad. It gave me perspective on my life and who I am, and it gave me new strategies for how to develop some of my strengths and how to alleviate some of my struggles. And this is what I want from entertainment. I want a safe space where I can explore who I am and what my life is and where I can gain understanding of myself and my life and the people around me. I understand now why I have loved the games I have loved my whole life. All my life, from the Colonel's Bequest when I was nine, through to the weird way I played S StarCraft in university, through the longest journey, through to Morrowind and Skyrim and Nekoatsume and many others. What I've always done with games is tend and befriend. These games have offered me spaces where I can care and where I can relate and where I can grow. And from there I have been able to bring those lessons back into my corner of the world and make it better, I hope. And isn't that what most of us want? And if not, why not? And I want to be very clear that care is not weak, simple, or cute, and doesn't only belong in simple or cute games. Audre Lorde famously said, caring for myself is not self-indulgence, it is self-preservation, and that is an act of political warfare. Likewise, caring for your chosen loved ones and the formation of new alliances can also be acts of warfare. It requires bravery to speak up, to reach out, to listen, and to build towards something new. Care is stronger than brutality or fear. Are you strong enough? Maybe, maybe not. I'm not, but the thing is, together we can be. No matter who you are, I ask you to question your assumptions about yourself, about other people, and about games. Get the real data. Talk to people who are different from yourself, and truly listen to them. And if you are lucky enough to not fit the game developer stereotype, look into your own heart. Maybe everything we know is wrong, but you are right. Maybe everything we know is wrong, but you are right. And then let's find each other and let's work together. Let's make games that will help us understand ourselves and each other and our lives. This is where video games can shine, not just as bright as, but brighter than other media. And these are games that will carry us into a more compassionate, more respectful and more respected future. I'm not even sure that video games are such a small corner of the world. I can see a future where games have saturated society, where automation and artificial intelligence have freed up our time and the lines between education and video games are blurred, and the lines even between work and video games are blurred, where we live in a playful, life-affirming, mixed AR, VR world. And if we design this world, if we all design this world together, we can design a better future. This is the industry I would want to work in. This is a world I would want to live in. Who knows, maybe we're here to take away the boys' games after all. Thank you. Thank you. I think we have time for yeah, quite a lot of questions if we want. Is there a microphone for questions? Yeah. Okay. I can't really see you guys very well. Hey, Bri. Great talk. Um, now that you've talked a lot about the trends that we are seeing in games and the things that maybe we could be putting in games, yes. uh, you didn't talk much about True Love, and I was wondering if you would tell us at all about what you want to do with it to show Tend and Befriend in your games, or tell us about even a project you're working on now. I'm um, sure. So 
Eve's game is called self-care, and it's sort of a Tamagotchi meets WarioWare, but with no time pressure. We have a top-down view of a character who stayed home for the day because they just really don't want to deal with the world. And there's lots of objects around the room, and each one is a meditative mini-game. Mini game. Um, each mini-game is kind of correlated with a treatment that works for PTSD, um, which happened kind of by chance. And then I read a book, and then I was like, oh, wow, that's really interesting. Um, <laughs> and the game that I'm working on with Alicia is kind of a game that... Is, you take on a date with you, or maybe we could even like make it like match you up with people like Tinder, but then it it's inspired by the 36 questions to make you fall in love. Have you read about that? So it's similar. It's like a pool of activities that lead you down a path of like increasingly intimate interactions, um, and then you have a really nice date. And that's Alicia's side project called Artificial Intelligence, which is a great fucking name. You mentioned uh, both that many people don't come to games or they don't come to art generally for stress. Yeah. Uh, but you also mentioned that the tendon befriend response, which people enjoy, can be triggered by stress or threat elements. Yes. So you do, do you see the solution to this more as decreasing the stress and threat element in games or providing an outlet? For I think there's so many options, so many solutions. Like, I'm stressed enough in my daily life that I don't like any challenge in games, but that's only me, and other people do. I th but I think if you think about, like, if you talk to women who already um, are interested in games, a lot of them, like, are self-selected to, like, fight or flight stuff as well, but there, I, I noticed that Ubisoft, like, a lot of the women that I was talking with, they really like chances to do, like, crafting and and talking with characters and doing quests and stuff in games. So, like, even if the game is, like, like you're fighting as the main gameplay loop, to have these tendon befriend beha behaviors in the game as a way to, like, maximize that oxytocin, it's it's also an option. It's just, like, a lot. I, I think we just haven't even thought about it yet, and there's so much we can do. Just like there's so many different kind of games that we have that have, like, this kind of frustration thing. Thank you. Hi, thank you for an excellent talk. Thank you. In uh, board games, there's a trend towards uh, more uh, cooperative games. Yes. Do you think there's uh, this has anything to do with, uh, with the stuff you're talking about? I love cooperative board games. I'm a really sore loser also, so that's another reason. But I, I mean, I just find cooperative board games more fun and more interesting, and it's def I like that would be why for me, because I don't want to have a conflict with the person that I'm hanging out with. Thank you. Hi. Thanks for the presentation. Um, Thank you. Uh, learning about Tenant Befriend has really opened my eyes and I, I'm really appreciative of that and hearing it from you. Thank you. Um, one example of it in video games that comes to my mind is Firewatch. Yes. Um, can you give us some other examples to maybe open up what it means in games? Um, I think in terms, like, specific examples, Nekoatsume, like, collecting cats and, and putting the things out for the cats, that's a really simple version of it. Um, any kind of like interactive novel where it's a, or a dating sim where it's all about characters, like that would be other excellent examples. Um, I think anything to like care is things like oh, um, like any game that is like Harvest Moon and all this and I'm blanking on the name of the one that we all play for like a year and a half or two years. Um, but anything that's to do with like doing farming or taking care of things or selecting things for things in the game. Um, resource management is taking care. Um, 
And then anything to do with characters. And this is where I would like to see the industry. This is where I would like to see it go a lot much more deeper because like, I'm not interested in all in graphics. It doesn't stimulate me with my physiology, but if we had deeper AI systems and I know we can have them because I've worked on them and because I'm an AI programmer, um, that like, I think that that would be so much more interesting and have like characters that you can really get to know that have dramas going on in the world that are systemic or procedural um, and where it's different every time you play it and you can like have your little like alliances and guilds and things like this. Like any anything that has like trades you can join where you join up with people or guilds you can join. This is all this kind of stuff. Hi, thanks Hi. for the amazing talk. Um, you. you mentioned the interesting way that you play StarCraft, mm -hmm. and you also mentioned that you w used to work on Company of Heroes, yes. and you're an AI programmer. Yeah. So I just want to ask that, did your uh, interest in like more, well, can you elaborate on the interesting way to play StarCraft, and maybe if that somehow correlates to the fact that Company of Heroes has squad-based unit compositions instead of individual units? Yeah, well, I, I wrote, I helped write the squad AI, but I did not design it. I can't take any credit for any of that. Like, I was a junior programmer there, and they gave me great opportunities to work on stuff that I was really passionate about, like the squad stuff. And, and definitely, like, why I like it is because it's it's about groups and groups of people. And, like, even on Assassin's Creed, then I did the, the group layer and group manipulations. I always kind of followed this theme in my career. Um, but, yeah, I, I went... Like, I was so thrilled to go work at Relic because I played RTS games mostly at that time. Um, I spent high school playing Warcraft 2 and, um, and then a lot of StarCraft in university, but I never played it competitively, ever. I played the single player or I, like, would dial up on the phone to my friends. And then, but I was, like I said, I'm a really sore loser, and so I would make rules like you're not allowed to build towers so that I win, and, like, <laughs> I did that. And then... Um, but because what I liked about the game was like clicking on the characters and hearing their lines and I liked like going through the tech tree and seeing all this stuff and then I liked making like really beautiful little villages and then protecting it. And then I, like, I didn't really like going destroying the other villages. And then um, I would try to play also like in Warcraft I would try to play by using the least amount of trees possible but then the score would be like for how much wood you cut and I was like it never made sense to me like aren't we supposed to be conserving wood? Like I don't know. But I love those games. Yeah. Thanks. Hi, thanks for the great talk. Um, I'm wondering, I've been really interested in, since you posted the blog post about the same subject a while ago, Yeah. I've been looking at these kind of games, and I've been really interested in games like Stardew Valley and, and yeah, games really, trying to say yeah, Thank you. <laughs> kind of like empathetic based games where yeah. you, I kind of hated the dungeon there. I think it was a bit out of place in the game, but I feel like there aren't enough resources in the games industry to look into these kind of designs. And I'm thinking about these game ideas to look into, and I feel like I, I I can't find references in the games industry. What do you feel like? Are there what kind of media should game developers look at to find these new ideas because I feel like movies have and, to and make books them. Have, have gone kind of f further there. And yeah. yeah. We have to make them. Yeah. Like even the, the psychology research around Tandem and Friend is like one research group at one university for 11 years or something. Yeah. It feels years. like you're kind of faced against the wall in the sense that there's so many books and resources about traditional game development yes. and tr traditional game design. And it's for people. It's so much easier to just go that way. It feels safer, right? But, but just as you said, it's yes. we need to take the risk and, and right. So yeah. wherever there's, like, I mean, if if you're, like, if you actually have the tandem of friend response, and then at some point you've become like intermediate game designer, like, and you know your stuff, you're much better positioned to take advantage of these kind of opportunities and make a lot of money than someone who only actually has the traditional response and like their their market is not as untapped. So they're in much more competition. So like, you, yeah, you need to put in some years like learning 
and how games work and stuff, but then you're really well positioned to like be a trailblazer. You have more opportunity. Have you looked at other media for inspiration or more like just real life in, in general? Um, I, yeah, I, I mean, a lot of other media. I'm very, like, I, I used to be much more of a gamer than anything else, but after, you know, the industry and the community around games becomes more and more hostile to women over the early 2000s and onward that I just became less and less interested and naturally became more and more interested in my other interests even though they were my secondary interests. So now I'm much more interested in like contemporary art and there's a lot of great artists working in care um, and, and film definitely. Well, not so much movies anymore. I only watch TV, but movies are too short. I don't want to get that invested in those characters and then it ends. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, that was a pause for effect. My name is Pash Trembeck. I work for the Swedish games industry. Yes. Brie, we started this conversation about over dinner yeah, the other we did. night, yeah. and we were cut off. So I was happy to hear the end of it. Thank you. When you talk about stress reaction, I hear that depending on the person, it's friend or tender befriend, yeah. or it's fight or flight. Are, are those two different characters? Are we one or the other, or um, can I we be both in different circumstances? Yeah. To, to introduce the concept, I simplified it, but I'm quite sure, I mean, the research is still unclear, but I'm quite sure that in different contexts you could have a different stress response. And the reason I'm quite sure of that is because I know, like, sometimes I get a fight or flight response. Um, so, like, it, it, different people will tend towards different responses, and, 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 and so then it will show in your character as well, like, the way that you tend to react to conflict or the the way that you tend to react to stress or pressure at work or something. Um, but it's not super cut and dry like you always have one or always have the other. That's a relief. <laughs> I think that says something about how games that have more of a ten and befriend core loop could be pro-social and influence behavior of people who have both responses. Maybe. Are we done? Oh, no, we're not. Hey, um, I was just thinking kind of as an AI programmer who's uh, interested in this sort of direction, do you have yeah. any advice if you are um, sort of wanting to get into AI programming to do similar things? Um, yes. How, how would you go about doing that? Um, I mean, there's so, there's just, there's so much possibility. I would love to talk after about some like ideas for frameworks or directions to go. It's it's like, but it's very detailed. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I imagine yeah. that's a pretty big. Question. Yes, but I I would love to talk about it. Okay. Yeah. Finished? Thank you.